Baron. Okay, thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, this is Linda, and I'm usually the reader. Right now, um, Nanette's going to try dialing in. She's having some connectivity issues. So we've gone ahead and started the recording. This is Humanities Team Conversation with God Book Club, and we are uh, currently reading Neil Donald Walsh's The Storm Before the Calm, Conversations with Humanity, Book One. We're on page 83, and it's conversation number 13, question number four, one person's thoughts. Sooner or later in our lives, we have to make a major decision about the most important question in life. What is our actual identity? Are we the physical manifestation of a biological incident, or are we something greater something more, something other than a mere mammal. Question four, who are you? As I observe it, I have several choices when it comes to how I think of myself. I also observe that there is no right way to answer this question. Choice number one, I could conceive of myself as a chemical creature, a logical biological incident. That is the logical outcome of a biological process engaged in by two older biological processes called my mother and my father. If I see myself as a chemical creature, I would see myself as having no more connection to the larger processes of life than any other chemical or biological life form. Like all the others, I would be impacted by life, but could have very little impact on life. I certainly couldn't create events, except in the most remote, indirect sense. I could create more life. All chemical creatures carry the biological capacity to recreate more of themselves. But I could not create what life does or how it shows up in any given moment. Further, as a chemical creature, I would see myself as having a very limited ability to create an intended response to the events and conditions of life. I would see myself as a creature of habit and instinct with only those resources that my biology brings me. I would see myself as having more resources than a turtle because my biology has gifted me with more. I would see myself as having more resources than a butterfly because my biology has gifted me with more. I would see myself as having more resources than an ape or a dolphin, but in those cases, perhaps not all the many more because my biology has gifted me with more. Yet that is all I would see myself as having in terms of resources. I would see myself as having to deal with life day by day, pretty much as it comes, with perhaps a tiny bit of what seems like control based on advancing, advanced planning, etc. But I would know that at any minute, anything could go wrong and often would. Another option. Choice number two, I could conceive of myself as a spiritual being inhabiting a biological mass that I call a body. If I saw myself as a spiritual being, I would see myself as having powers and abilities far beyond those of a simple chemical creature, powers that transcend basic physicality and its laws. I would understand that these powers and abilities give me collaborative control over the exterior elements of my individual and collective life and complete control over the interior elements, which means that I have total ability to create my own reality because my reality has nothing to do with producing the exterior elements of my life and everything to do with how I respond to the elements that have been produced. My purpose has to do with my interior life. Also, as a spiritual being, 
I would know that I am here on earth, that is, for a spiritual reason. This is a highly focused purpose and has little to do directly with my occupation or career, my income or possessions or achievements or place in society or any of the exterior conditions or circumstances of my life. I would know that my purpose has to do with my interior life and that how well I do in achieving my purpose may very often have an effect on my exterior life. Who are you? For the interior life of each individual cumulatively produces the exterior life of the collective. That is, those people around you and those people who are around those people who are around you. It is in this way that you, as a spiritual being, participate in the evolution of your species. My decision. My answer to question number four. I've decided that I'm a spiritual being, a three-part being made up of body, mind, and soul. Each part of my tripart being has a function and a purpose. As I come to understand each of those functions, each aspect of me begins to be more efficiently serve its purpose in my life. I am an individuation of divinity, an expression of God, a singularization of the singularity. There is no separation between me and God, nor is there any difference except in proportion. Put simply, God and I are one. This brings up an interesting question. Am I rightly accused of heresy? Are people who believe that they are divine nothing but raving lunatics? And they, are they, worse yet, apostates? I wondered, so I did a little research. I wanted to find out what religious and spiritual sources had to say on the subject. Here's what I found. Isaiah 41, 23. Shew the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold together. Psalm 82, 6. I have said gods ye are, and sons of the Most High, all of you. John 10, 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? The Indian philosopher Adi Shankara, 788 CE to 820 CE, the one largely responsible for the initial expounding and consolidation of the Advaita Vedanta, wrote in his famous work, um, Viva Ketchadamandat. Quote, Brahman is the only truth. The spatio-temporal world is an illusion, and there is ultimately Brahman, an individual self. Close quote. Sri Swami Krishnamanda Saraswati Maharishi, April of 25th, 1922 to November 23rd, 2001, a Hindu saint said, quote, God exists. There is only one God. The essence of man is God. According to Buddhism, there ultimately is no such thing as a self independent from the rest of the universe, the doctrine of Anatta. Also, if I understand certain Buddhist schools of thought correctly, humans return to earth in subsequent lifetimes in one of six forms, the last of which are called divas, which is variously translated as gods or deities. 
Meanwhile, the Chinese discipline of Taoism speaks of embodiment and pragmatism, engaging practice to actualize the natural order within themselves. Taoists believe that man is a microcosm for the universe. Hermetism is a set of philosophical and religious beliefs, or Gnosis, based primarily on the Hellenistic Egyptian pseudo, let's see, pseudo pyrographical writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, Hermetician, teaches that there is a transient God, the all or one cause of which and the entire universe participate, of which we and the entire universe participate. The concept was first laid out in the Emerald Tablet of the Hermes Trismegistus, in the famous words, quote, that which is below corresponds to that which is above, and that which is above corresponds to that which is below to accomplish the miracles of the one thing. And in Sufism, an esoteric form of Islam, the teaching there is no God but God was long ago changed to there is nothing but God, which would make me, well, God. Enough? Do you wish or need more? You might find it instructive or fascinating to go to Wikipedia, the source to which I owe my appreciation for much of the above information. As well, read the remarkable books of Houston Smith, 91 years of age, at this writing, and a globally honored professor of religion. Among the titles of his that I most often recommend, the world's religions are great wisdom traditions, 1958, revised edition 1991, Harper One, and Forgotten Truth, the Common Vision of the World's Religions, 1976, with a reprint edition of 1992, Harper One. So, that is my answer to the fourth question. I am out picturing. I am an outpicturing of the divine. I am God in human form. So too, of course, are we all. Points I hope you'll remember. The question of who you are is the most important question of your life. There is no right way to answer that question. You have a couple of choices when it comes to how you think of yourself. Actions I hope you'll take. Look at this question deeply, not once, but every day, first thing in the morning and last thing at night for one solid year. Look at the question and give yourself the answer that tr feels true for you in that moment. Do not tailor the answer to what you think an enlightened being would say. Let your answer be the truth. Give yourself permission to move your conversation with others into this important area. After discussing the three persistent questions, gently invite the exploration into a look at this most profound inquiry. See the final of the seven simple questions for brief hints on how to hold a seven questions discussion group. End of chapter. I could say something if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, every week we read these pages and we get to this last bit and it's points I hope you will remember, action I hope you will take. And every week I think, yes, I must do this. And we're now on conversation 13 and I haven't kept it up you know I have to be honest I haven't kept it up and I wish I had and I, I've tried um and I've got some way but I'm way back I'm not on um conversation 13 so I just think that well I just just saying to you well you know I think it's a good idea it would be a good idea 
for us to keep it up and I'm going to try harder. And the other thing about this book, um, in the back, I ne- is it this book? Oh no, it's not. I am, um, ah, I thought it was this one. There's a book somewhere, it might be book four, with 50 questions on the CWG material. And I went through the questions and I was so surprised at how little I knew. So um, if I find the book and um, which book it's in, I'll let you know. But um, yeah, just those two points. Thank you. I, uh, I wanted to just share that it's, it's very, and, and I agree, Angela, I think it's very challenging. Um, what I am trying to do is I have a little tiny notebook and um, I'm trying to keep that with me and, um, and do the work. Uh, but you really, I mean, you have to carry it with you all the time and you have to really um, be ready. And I agree, I, I'm having a difficult time keeping up as well. I also signed up for the compassion course that Tom Bond is doing. And um, that's another one where there's like weekly lessons and same thing. It's very difficult to keep up. I feel as if something has happened with the timeline. Um, I, I, I can say personally, I'm having extreme challenges managing time in a way that I've never had before. Um, so that, that may be playing into it. The other thing that I, what I started to say was, um, it's interesting too, how teachers, um, spiritual teachers have overlapping timing on teachings and readings and just, I, this was written not a, a, quite a while ago, but here we are, we're reading it right now. And what Matt Kahn just did last week in his um, most recent, I think it was his total integration course, um, he did a whole thing about, hello, divine, I am, hello. Right? Say that to yourself over and over again. Hello, divine, I am, hello. Like, reinforcing that we are divinity, <clears throat> your divinity, saying to yourself, hello, divine, I am, hello. You know? Um, so that's just a, and it just, feeds right into this lesson because that's what this chapter was just all about. We are divinity. Where the other, uh, I saw a post also this last week that was very helpful and ties right into this that, that talked about, worded it this way, um, you're not a human being. You're not a human being. You have a human being, right? We each have a human being that is our responsibility that we reside within but that we are not actually that human being we're the spirit we're the divinity that is residing within that human being and i just thought that was just such a a great way to to put it over Thanks, Linda, definitely. And um, I love that. Hello, divine. I am. Hello. I think that's lovely. Um, and the other thing is regarding the time. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that because um, I'm absolutely just finding the same. It's just like crazy, to be honest. <laughs> that's all I can say really regarding time. It's just, um, and the thing is as well, I've got things going on with the clocks in the house. I've got one clock in the kitchen that was my father's. Um, it's just a little tiny clock that changes when the time changes, it changes itself. But since, because I'm actually living in a house um, in my mother's house, my father never lived here, but I'm actually living in my mother's house with the father's clock. And um, it's, at the moment, it's an hour slow. So I know what time it is because it's an hour slow. But it, when I first came here to live, it would always set, go off. The alarm would always go off at half past six. I just could not stop it. It would just go off at half past six every evening. But then it's changed over time. I've been here five years. And um, it, it, does, it doesn't change when the clocks change, but it changes some other time during the year. 
and it's been two hours out and now it's one hour out but i've also got um, another carriage clock in the hall that my goodness i really do not know what's going on with the carriage clock in the hall but it's i put a new battery in and um and then it started to go wrong and i thought well i need to just put a battery in that battery's useless so i went and got a better quality battery put that in and then it just stopped at 25 minutes past five and then over a period of about a fortnight it moved to uh, 10 minutes to six and it's done all sorts of things i've actually today i've just written down what it's done so i can remember because what it's done it's just i don't know what it, but at the moment it's three hours uh slow <laughs> so, so, sounds about right um, yeah <laughs> And it was three o'clock at 6 p.m. today, because we're now at something past seven. At 6 p.m. today, it was shown at 3 p.m. So that's where we're at at the moment. So I'm just going to let it do its thing. And yeah, that's what's happening in my life. <laughs> Over. <sighs> Fascinating. I wanted to say that I also resolve to do those exercises and then forget to do those exercises a lot. And I'm nowhere near caught up with it all. And also time, I've just sort of given up time. Time does its thing. I do my thing. I pay attention when I have to, like if I have a appointment or something as best I can. But like it, me and time, it, it's been months now. It's like, I just don't know what's happening there it's so i just it's completely out of control how's that for a way to put it the other thing i wanted to share was that um what i don't remember what we read last week and but the whole book is about this idea that we are divine you know and this is a belief i had before these books i put it we're little chips off the God block, you know? Like if God's the creation, I mean, the creator, then everything that comes from God is God. That was sort of my concept. But as for actually feeling that, I have not really felt that all the time, God knows. So this past week, that's been what I've been doing is just like lying in bed to go to sleep and think, oh, you know, I'm divine. What does that feel like? and just sort of or or when i'm going about my day but it always happens when i go to bed at night and just kind of feeling into that feeling of the largerness you know it's like a larger perspective is what it is for me um so it's funny to then read this chapter and i know that that exercise was probably inspired by whatever we read last week that i don't remember but then this week it's all about that so anyway, I think that's all I had to share. Thank you, over. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. I just want to let you know I am here and I'm listening. I've had so many troubles that I'm, I'm not paying attention to the time because I can't keep up when I rebooting my computer and everything. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know that for the moment, I'm here. I'm glad you're here, Nanette, because I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad everyone's here. Does anyone Thank want you. an update on where I was? <laughs> because even if you don't, I'd like to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Neil Dahl Walsh was, um, had this e-treat, uh, which is friendship with God. And the books are fine, but you should hear the people who bring their lists of problems. I mean, honestly, they act like Neil is God himself. <laughs> I was laughing my head off. That was the best entertainment I've had. It, I mean, 
mean, the whole thing was 12 hours. But I mean, if you want a lesson, uh, my dear Mary, on who God is, I'll tell you, just look at the mirror, darling. <laughs> like every one of us is God and get over yourself by thinking Neil's got the answers. I mean, <laughs> I have never been so entertained. Well, we'll try to continue, but one of the things that I, it, you just reminded me of it, Shabana. Um, when I met Archbishop Desmond Tutu down in South Africa, he said, if you're, you're having problems wondering where God is, look at the person sitting right next to you. If you don't see that that's God, then you're never going to find God. So it's not only in yourself. God is in everyone. Yeah, Over. exactly. That, I mean, I'm glad that Desmond Tutu actually said it because, um, you know, as a bishop, that's a pretty humble thing. <laughs> you know, when you're way up high like that, it's impressive. You, you're on mute. I would just say, I, that reminds me of, um, I was in town shopping one day and I was approached by um, a couple of people and the, one of them said, um, would you like to find God? And I said, no, it's okay, thank you. I know where God is. And um, when I was asked, where is God? I said, well, you're looking at her <laughs> and they carried about my business. <laughs> Over. Oh, Angela, you are hilarious. I wish I said that. <laughs> I love that, Angela. When I run into those people, I usually just say, you know, me and God are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the one about I didn't know he was lost. Oh, that's good, too. <laughs> I mean, it's old, but it just cracks me right up. <laughs> anyway, it was highly, highly entertaining, I'll tell you. Um, for people not to know that they have agency and that we are creators. I mean, it just sort of makes me scratch my head. But I do want to thank you, Nanette, for running this thing because, uh, I mean, it's Neil's books that I got it out of. Like, especially if they're going to a Neil Donald Walsh event, have they ever read the books? Or they, they sure have. have. any of the material? then why don't they, I mean, well, then sh shouldn't they also have that understanding? Well, anyway, Mary judging, I'll shut up. <laughs> well, Mary, you don't have to shut up and you don't have to stop judging. It's just that we're, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say in my own stupid way, uh, in my own enlightened way, um, I'm trying to be less judgmental, um, is that we're lucky to have this group because um, everyone gets to say whatever they feel like saying. And um, we're slowly getting through each book. So I don't know, for me, it actually sank in. And the people who were putting Neil on this pedestal, um, I just felt sad for them that they couldn't be part of this group. I agree that the way we you know, slowly read and it sinks in, the way we do it, reading and discussing like that really does help us to internalize it. I agree. So I guess I have to blame Nanette for helping us and maybe Linda too. <laughs> well, we'll all take the blame. Um, I think one of the things though, because I've I worked directly with Neil and used to, and it was kind of a joke because he would say, you know, I'm on my phone ring. I was like, oh my God, I don't feel like talking to him right now. And it was not because I don't love Neil and I do love Neil, but he, he's an idea man and he comes up with so many ideas that I couldn't keep up with him. So it was real tough for me. And I had a friend who loves 
Oops. And she goes, you're the only person on the planet that I know that doesn't want to talk to Neil right now. <laughs> and I just said, well, um, but I think that uh, it, it's practice, 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 sort of like, how do you get to be home? You know, you practice, practice, practice. And I think how we understand these things, and Mary, I did, wasn't taking you as being judgmental, is you're voicing what is. It, it, you know, just because we don't want it to be a certain way, doesn't isn't a certain way, um, until we've re reached a perfection, which I don't think is reachable until you're with, you know, I think we're perfect in our own ways, is what I'm trying to say. So you're perfect okay. as you are. Yes, I, 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 Nanette, your um, internet connection is really, really cutting out, but I want to tell you all a joke. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to hear it, that's too bad. What happened is, that uh, you just, it, it is your fault again, Nanette, and blame you for everything, because you said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 right? So I'm from New Brunswick. Well, I mean, I was in New Brunswick. That's where my kids were born. And my son was in the youth orchestra. And right after 9-11, um, the youth orchestra was supposed to go and perform at Car Carnegie Hall. And um, the uh, first violist, Marto, was Jewish. And his parents said, no way in the world we'll ever send our precious son to Carnegie Hall because he might get killed on the bus. So my son was assistant whatever the hell it is, the leader, you know, concert master. This, this was... Yes, is he and everything's all set or no? Yes, but I also have this problem. I think you need also, to mute uh, Robert, uh, uh, someone. I didn't go out the last yeah. couple of days, but all of a sudden... I, I, can't, can't, I can't hear myself. Anyway, so what happened is that my son, Mahmoud, was made concert master. So he played at Carnegie Hall because Matra didn't. That's the joke, that it wasn't even his parents decided. <laughs> and my kids missed him and we didn't care whether he got killed or not. Not our problem, just go. I, I have something to say and um, you know, we're looking at ourselves from the outside and um, the divinity is what's being held hostage inside and the liberation is to liberate our divine nature which is love and it comes through opening the heart and people, we don't know how to open the heart. It's a bit like a rusty can. We've been looking at things from the outside. So that's what I've got to say. And, and, and because of that, the divine nature is imprisoned. It's not active in the world. If it were active in the world, when it's active in the world, the words are better. When it's active in the world, when we've activated it, everything will blossom because love and its connectedness is joy. And life is a life is heaven is a heaven here on earth. And um, we can each grow in the capacity of the individual unique part of the divine nature that we are here to express. And the whole of divinity, how, how, I, how I start seeing it is 
there's a lovely, uh, beautiful, beautiful creation, uh, but it needs to be reflected from the bottom up and from the top down. And we are, we are the vehicle, we are part of the vehicle through which that could be achieved. So it's a bit like, you know, when you look at the lovely lake and it's got all the plants mirrored in the lake, with a, if you have a peaceful water, you see all this beautiful, beautiful reflection. And what is, what it, what is reflected in this mirror is, is held also in the great creation, what is held in the earth creation. They're both depending on each other and we are very, we're very important in this, in making sure this is possible, in making sure Carnegie Hall and all its great music can um, be shared. Thank you. And I just want to say, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. It's all about the heart and we really do I mean, I've said it before many times, we need to keep our hearts open. For sure, we need to keep our hearts, our hearts open. Um, and your passion, I mean, you were, it's something that you're really, really passionate about, and that's wonderful. And I would also say, like, um, it's a matter of perspective. It's, and you, you thank you for giving us your perspective of it. Because not everyone can see that as you see it. So because they can't see it, they don't see it all your way. They don't share your passion as such. But we all appreciate it, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And it's all about the heart for sure. Thank you. Can I say something also? Thank you for Bob Larrick and thank you for your spirit. Is it okay? Please do. Thank you for your spirit. Just watching the news. I'm sorry I get here late all the time. Um, it's such a, a wonderful spirit. And I keep telling my wife, we can be wonderful and loving even if we're not perfect as loving uh, individuals. And it's such a, um, a lovely spirit and wonderful spirit, Holy Spirit, to, to act in, with that type of a, an attitude and spirit, where does our spirit come from, uh, rather than the culture war politics of just power and the, uh, the supremacy of the other, um, and the need to work together better, uh, believing in government, God, and faith, and reason, and don't we need to create that type of, what's so wrong with that type of spirit and faith? as opposed to just culture war, rather heathen politics. <laughs> I hope I'm not upsetting people. <laughs> um, but uh, the need to create this type of spirit on earth, uh, things that I had worked on, actually the Temple of Understanding and others uh, at the UN, and they still do have a culture, but it's not just for the UN, it's for America, how do we, integrate a more ethical, rational, humanistic, uh, loving spirit of which you demonstrate and to use our energy more constructively in our relationships uh, and societies. So thank you ag again for this type of discussion and spirit and how culturally different it is and the, the spirit that we seem to be watching in our lives, the way things are going. Don't we need health and hap health and better human relations and a better spirit for better, healthy, happy, holy, peaceful societies and lives? Those are all things I was I've been working on. Obviously, not too successfully. So I, I really appreciate your spirit and and this type of discussion. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, none of us, 
in fact, nobody I've ever met on these calls has ever, you know, thought that they were perfect. We all know we are imperfectly perfect. Um, and our goal isn't to be, at least mine isn't, my goal isn't to be perfect like God Jr. Um, I just want to be better than I was yesterday and not as good as I can be tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Because my wife keeps telling me I'm not perfect. <laughs> or or to scream it at me for not being perfect, actually. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we have to give up the judgment. You know, judgment of ourselves anyway. It starts there, really. Yes, we're too judgmental. I think so, too. Or overly critical and not loving enough. And thank you for the, this type of spirit. And that does start with loving ourselves. It's like we criticize ourselves and, you know, like trying to protect ourselves from being criticized by other people so we do it first and that develops that like hateful tone that we take and sometimes we take it in relationships with other people as well as to ourselves you know it's like that mean voice that mean voice inside that's what we have to learn how to reprogram into a loving voice towards ourselves and others, you know? And um, that, I really think that the work of learning to love ourselves is the most, it's the first step. The most important first step is learning to embrace ourselves, who we are, the child inside, you know, who was, even in good families, there's always that feeling of, am I doing it right? Am I good enough, you know? And it's like all these wounded people walking around in the world trying to relate to each other. And the healing has to start with healing our own hearts and, you know, accepting that hurt little child inside as our sweet little baby whom we adore. And I like what Linda said about we have a human because then it's like my human is like my cat, you know, I love my cat and I would do anything for her. So my human, you know, I'm learning to love her the way I love my cat. And it's kind of unconditional, you know, and when she is too needy, I might be like, oh my God, I just walked you to the kitchen to eat, but I still walk her to the kitchen to eat for like the fifth time because she likes me to pet her while she eats, you know. Anyhow, that that's my thing is is I really do believe that the first thing that needs to be healed is our own heart and then we can expand that love into the circle, you know, of encompassing the entire world universe, all of God's creation. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to follow Thank up you. on what Mary said to remind everybody that technically there isn't anything out there, right? Everything comes from within. And so the healing of ourselves, the healing of our hearts is the only work to do, really. Because if you do that, everything else sorts itself out over. I just have a question. Uh, is anyone in this group allergic to cats? I used to Me. be. Me. I am. <laughs> yes. Is that you, Angela? Yep. Are cats you okay? and house dust. And okay. house mites. Okay. So, uh, is everyone okay with dogs? I'm okay with dogs. All right, now we're going can, to do the meditation. I just wanted to be sure. Can I just say, before you say that, I just want to say something about ju being judgmental because Nanette said earlier about what Mary said. I've forgotten quite what she said, but Mer uh, Nanette said that Mary wasn't being judgmental. She was just saying what is. And I think there's, a, you know, that's truth in that. We're just saying what is, but maybe perhaps 
sometimes it's better if you recognize what it's just to keep it to yourself perhaps it because it may come be come across as being judgmental yes Yes, that's a good, good point. Very good point, Angela. Now, what Thanks. I want to know is, is anyone allergic to rose-colored glasses? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Not my knowledge. <laughs> okay, all right. So what we're going to do in this meditation, well, I've had to change it a little bit because of Angela. Um, so there's no cats, there's only dogs. And what we're going to do before we get to the dogs is each of us is, this is all imaginary. You don't have to run out and go and get what I'm saying. Just put on your rose colored glasses, everyone. Put your hands on top of your heart, everyone. And imagine that there's a cute little puppy who's decided to be quiet for the duration of the meditation. So we've got this dog, uh, which is our human, or our, like, you, you know what Linda and Mary were saying, we've just got this animal here, and we put it on top of our heart, and now we've got our hands on top of that. And as Angela said, there's no such thing as judgment because we've already got these rose colored glasses on. So here's the meditation and it's very, very complicated. I love you. 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 Amen. Okay, everyone. Oh my goodness, I lifted my hands up and the dog ran away. <laughs> Whereas mine lives in my heart. Um, I just wanted to share that when I first started meditating, I had a cat and I'm sitting there all, you know, meditating and up comes the cat and wants to sit right on my heart. That's what she wants. And it's like, I thought in that moment, okay, I have a choice to make, you know, I can either think I'm going to be this perfect meditator and the cat doesn't belong, or I'm going to be this perfect meditator whose cat sits on her heart. And so, you know, that was how I meditated henceforth while that kitty was alive. She would sit on my heart and I would have to hold her there. <laughs> so that was kind of fun for me. And my puppy became a cat almost immediately because, because you told me to put them on my heart <laughs> and it was my cat. Thank you. I love that meditation. Oh, I love you, Mary. That's so beautiful. I, I just, uh, I can just see it. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Um, I will just say before we go, um, 
I mentioned earlier about those 50 questions and it's actually, I think in the, in um, the back of conversations with God, book four, Awaken the Species, 50 questions on the uh, CWT material. Ah, oh, Angela, you're always so full of wisdom. I've got my book right here. I'm going to look at it right as soon as I get off. Thank you. I don't have that one. I'll have to get it because I didn't start the book club until after that. I'll I never read like, the first few books. Okay, thank you, Shabana. Yeah, I'll email it to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, everybody. Does anybody else have any closing comments? I just love you, Nanette, but I would never tell you that. <laughs> okay. I won't I won't tell anybody that you told me. <laughs> and I was just gonna say, I just love you all so much. Thank you all for being here for this club every week. Thank yes. you for your wonderful spirit and loving kindness. Yeah. It's a blessing to the world. I second that motion. <laughs> I agree. Well, I love everybody, and hopefully within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have a, a new computer, and I won't have these issues that put me on edge. I'm trying to embrace the edginess, but it's not working out too well. <laughs> me too. I just got a new computer and lost my wallet. <laughs> anyway, it'll work out. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Love you all, and we'll see you next week. Thank you again. You're all wonderful. I love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Love you too. Bye. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you, Linda, for doing the reading. We appreciate you. Yeah. And we appreciate Thank everybody. Thank you, Linda. All right. Bye, Thank everybody. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,